show you the first computer. So this was the first computer. It started in 1946, just after the Second World War. And the main goal of this computer was to improve the capability to predict the ballistic propagation, uh, let's say. This was done in Philadelphia. It was basically huge. This was a basic transistor. It has a length of maybe 10 centimeters. And this computer was maybe twice this room. It was in Philadelphia. When they turned on the computer, there was a huge blackout in all the city. So that was the starting point. Then the technology has been developing a lot. And here we have the first personal computer, the Apple one. You have now maybe some dozen of these ex existing, and each one can be sold for maybe $700,000. And the capability is only four kilobytes of RAM, so it's simply ridiculous. Any smartphone will be better than this one. Then you have a huge improvement of technology. You go from the previous one to the silicon photonics, silicon hardware, you have now today's supercomputer and today's smartphone, which are much more powerful than the previous huge computer. So now the question is, how far can we go? So basically, each two years, we have the double of computational capability of before, and the cost of the processor is half. So we are reducing the transistor, the microprocessor. We are gaining power of computation. And we are doing this. We are even moving the factory from Europe to China. So we have lower price, more power. What is the ultimate limit? When we will stop improving the computer, at some point, our transistor will reach the size of a single atom. So this is a very important journal. The name is Nature Nanotechnology. And in that case, the transistor, which manipulates the information, is only one single atom shown here, which is elaborating the information. But what's going on now? Your transistor is one atom. And as you have seen all this week, when you are dealing with one atom, you are not more in our world, you are in the quantum world, and the quantum world behaves in a different way. So this uh, result had large interest in the newspapers in Spain on transistor del tamaño de un átomo como antesala del ordenador quantico. In Italy, we said, we have here the New York Times, and all the main newspapers were saying this is a key step toward what is the futuristic quantum computer. So my goal of today is to show you what could be a quantum computer, because it's still not known. It's very difficult to give you all the technical detail. My goal is only to give you what is the conceptual idea which is behind the quantum computer. So you see, the, the New York Times say a futuristic quantum computer that might one day function in another scale world and will be orders of magnitude smaller and quicker than today's silicon-based machines. So if you want to spend a lot of money, you can buy a quantum computer I mean, at least they claim it's a quantum computer. It's a Canadian company. The name is D-Wave. They can sell you a quantum computer for $10 million. Uh, obviously, they have sold uh, four or five machines. Who can buy a quantum, something like that? Google, NASA, Google has billions of dollars. So they said, OK, we want to buy one. I don't know if it is working, but we want to understand what's going on. And now the key point that this D-Wave quantum computer is somewhat like the first computer. It's huge. But now the question is, it, is it really quantum? So maybe you are buying $10 million. You have inside a simple Mac, which is doing all the job. And no one can tell you if this is a real quantum machine or they are cheating. So now. 
this is, it was, let's say, the first one was said two years ago, and now our question is to understand if this machine is truly quantum, first question, it seems that this is a truly quantum device. We also have our own quantum computer but in, in Rome, but it's really, really, really primitive one, as I will show you later. And then the second question is, is this $10 million device more powerful than a classical computer? But I have not yet told you how it's made, a quantum computer. I only say quantum, blah, blah. So, we have to know, so this will be the final point. Now we have to come back later of 100 years ago. So we start from what you know from the high school, what is the classical physics. In your picture, you have two type of behavior. You have matter, which is made of particle. The, part, the matter follows the Newton laws. And on the other side, you have radiation. You have electromagnetic radiation, you have Maxwell equation, you have waves. So, Maybe. let's start from the classical physics. So, you know very well classical physics. You know F equal MA and so on. And what, why I'm showing this video? Because we have a key point in classical physics that if you know all the boundary condition of a problem, you can perfectly predict how your system will evolve. So this is a classical system. You can calculate all the trajectory, and you know at the end who's gonna, going to win and to lose. It's always the same which win and always the same which lose. And this is an example where you have a full predictivity of your system. So this guy is going to lose. And this is predictable, fully. That's a big difference with the quantum mechanics. Then we have electromagnetic field. You know the electromagnetic waves. You know that you have X-wave, uh, optical radiation, and so on. And at the end of the 18th century, the basic idea was that all the physics could be explained within this framework kinematics of bodies, and Maxwell equation. And everything was explained by these two. These are the Maxwell equations that you don't know in the present form, and the Newton law. But now what's going on is that when do your theory fail, and you have to find another theory, when you find some experiments that you are not able to describe with the tool that you have in your hand. And what's going on that there were, let's say, I'm only summarizing very briefly two type of phenomena which could not be described by the classical physics. One was to explain the stability of the atomic systems while the electron were moving around the nucleus without dropping on it. And the second phenomena, the so-called so photoelectric phenomena, how can we explain that light, which excites the material, so you have a conversion, you have an expulsion of electron in the material, how you could explain the data you were observing? And the first one to understand this phenomena was Einstein in the 1905. He wrote a paper on the photoelectric phenomena, and for this paper he got the Nobel Prize, and not for the relativity. So this is the starting point, there is a problem, and we have the solution. And what is the solution? That we understand that we have two worlds. We have our world, the macroscopic world, the world of the ball, the world of the cat, the world of where we live, and we have on the other side the microscopic physics of nucleus, ions, and so on. And today we are going to ask, where is the boundary here between our world and the quantum world? So let me say in a few slides what is the key message of quantum mechanics. 
the energy as the material, as a discontinuous nature, and it is formed by elementary quantity. So we have some quanta. That's why the theory is called quantum physics. And all the process of interaction between bodies are quantized. So before we have seen in Catalina's talk all the possible particles which describe all the type of interaction. In this very simple picture, we will only consider light. You know that light is made by particle, the quanta of light, the photons. And then you know that in the classical picture, you have the electromagnetic field, you have the color of light can go from the red to the violet, and you know that the color of light depends from the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation. And you also know that the wavelength is strictly related with the frequency of the oscillation. And then one can see that each quanta of light, the energy is quantized, you have photons, and the energy of each photon is the following. It's the frequency time h, where h is the key number, it's the Planck constant. So, this is a fundamental point, and the fact that this constant exists implies the existence of quantum mechanics. So up to now, I think all what I said, you know that. So now let's start having something a bit different. So this is, you already, uh, that's a key picture. This is a picture of the survey conference in 1927, where you have all the fathers of quantum mechanics. So in this picture, you have something like 15, 20 Nobel Prize, Planck, Einstein, Bohr, and they take them around 10, 20 years to completely define the theory of quantum mechanics. So now I want to show you a key part. So you know very well this equation. You know that in this equation you have a force acting on the system. You have the mass which describes a system. And you have the acceleration which is the consequence of the force acting on the system. So now we are asking ourselves how this equation is changing when we go to the quantum world. And what we obtain is a Schrodinger equation. So we have to remember this name, Schrodinger. He will get the Nobel Prize for this equation. And in this equation, I want to sh show you three key points. One, this is the Hamiltonian. It's something that one we study in the third year of physics. We can say that the Hamiltonian describes the system that we are considering, like the force. Then you have this, what we call this H bar. H bar means H div divided by 2 pi. This is, again, the Planck constant. It's the same constant that we had for the energy of photon. But what I'm interested in, in is psi, in this Greek letter. This is a wave function, which describes the system. And uh, we use the following formalism, that when we write the wave function of a quantum particle, we write this psi inside this symbol, which is called the cat, not as a cat, it's K-E-T. So my goal now is to now give you a feeling of what is the wave function of a particle. The wave function of a particle fully describes the system you are investigating. It's like the position, the velocity, the acceleration. But we have a, a key element. When you have a classical particle, you can fully know its position, its velocity, its acceleration. Instead, in a quantum system, you will never be able to know everything about the wave function. So now, I'm giving you an example to understand what's the very, what is strange in the wave function. To do that, 
we will start from the interference phenomena. Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize, say interference is the earth of quantum mechanics. In reality, it contains the only mystery of quantum mechanics. So, you know what is interference. You can consider some water, you can move inside your water to stones. Each stone will create a wave, and the two waves will interfere among them. And you will have constructive and destructive interference. So now, we will go, let's move to the quantum world. So now, I, this is the only explanation I'm giving you. It will last only less than five minutes. So we consider a source of a quantum particle. This quantum particle can be photon. We consider a wall. The wall has two walls that we call A and B. And then we have a screen where we are observing where the particles are going. Then we put a shutter over B, and we stop this work. The particles are emitted by the source, and we ask ourselves where the particles are going. And we are going to measure the particle on the wall. We repeat the experiment many, many times, many, many times. We wait this old classical computer. And at the end, you obtain some probability to detect the particle over the screen. And so, when this hole is closed, you will detect all the particles basically here, and you will get the following probability behavior. This is. Then you can do the opposite experiment. You stop the hole A, you open the ball B, and you look where the particle is going. And you obtain the following. You will get the probability on the other side. So now imagine that you send only one particle per time. So you, you have only one particle which is traveling. What you will expect if you open the two hole, you will expect that the particle can travel via the A all or via the B all. So you will expect to observe the following behavior. This is what we call a classical physics. What instead you will observe if you use quantum particle of, you will have quantum interference and you will observe the following behavior. Some interference of the probability where you will get constructive interference and destructive interference. And you will see the following pattern. So now my, my question is, where is the particle going? Via the A all or via the B all? Because if the, if the particle is going, is passing via the following hole, should, you should detect the particle here. If the particle was going via the B hole, you should get the particle here. So what is the conclusion? Is that, what is the conclusion that you will say? Can you say that she's going, that the particle is going via the two holes? So that's a good point. So you are almost correct, but you should only change something. You should say, if it is, it is like if the particle was going via the two holes, because no one is observing the particle in the two holes. So you, it's behaving if so, the particle is somewhat using the two holes at the same time. But no one is looking to that. So what we will say, it is if, it is like, so this is a correct statement. And how we will write this using our quantum formalism? I will say the following. 
in the classical world, a particle can travel along the path A or B. In the quantum physics, we can say somewhat that the quantum particle can travel along the path A and the path B at the same time. And we will call this a superposition state because they are basically A plus B at the same time. And how we can write that is the following. Okay, this is Italian photon, but this means photon in A plus photon in B. So this is the wave function of your particle. So now we can have an idea, as is suggested. I do this experiment, and then I will try, in some very maybe smart way, to see where the particle is going to. So may I try to do this experiment, and then I put here some very advanced microscope, which is trying to measure where the particle is walking. And now there is something interesting, because as soon as you will get an information where the particle is propagating, you will lose the interference. So when you observe the particle, when you try to see if the particle is in A or, or in B, or both in A and in B, you lose the quantum interference. So you obtain a guy again a classical behavior. So can we say where the particle is going? No, we cannot answer this question because as soon as you try to measure it, you are changing it. So this is what I told you, and now we have a key point that for the first time, this is a key difference with the classical physics, the observation is disturbing the phenomenon. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So here you can get a slogan that you can use many times, eat from bit. And this slogan was, let's say, the first time used by John Wheeler. So the idea is that bit represents the information you obtain from a system, while it represents the reality of a system. So basically we can say that the reality is also created by our questions. It's not something which is independent from our question. And the more information you gain, the more you are changing the reality. What I can say is that this claim is not only true in the quantum world, but also in today's world with Facebook and so on and Twitter. So information is changing the reality very fast. So you can imagine that this statement can also explain somewhat our social behavior. So now I have a question. I told you that this is done with photons. Do you think that we can do the same type of experiment using one electron? So I create an electron, I send it into two holes, and try to measure where the electron is coming out. Can I measure the quantum interference between two electrons? So the answer is, we, we say yes, electrons. We say no, no one. OK, the answer is yes. So you need a cannon, a, can, a gun for electrons, and you measure where the particle is going, and you get this are the pattern of interference that you measure on the wall. Now I have a question. And what about a ball? So I take a wall, I make two walls, I take a soccer, and I, can I observe quantum interference between two big balls? You say no. Okay, and now these are the two extreme cases. Where is the boundary? So w when should I stop? We one particle has quantum interference. A ball has not quantum interference. And a small ball, so as a small ball, we will consider the fuller rene. It's a molecule which has a shape. I'm sorry, it's missing here. It's a slide. Was a shape 
very similar to a soccer ball, there are 60 atoms of carbons which are interconnected. Do you think that we can see quantum interference with this large molecule? We say yes, or we say no, one, one, one. So we have two against the one, no, three. So obviously, if I make you the question, is that the answer is yes, likely, because otherwise. So obviously, it's a non-trivial experiment, because you cannot take this in your kitchen and try to do this experiment. You need some very elaborated stuff. And at the end, what you obtain is quantum interference. But then you can also try to have something more. You are not taking the full array as shown here, which was, you can take much larger molecules. These molecules as 400 atoms, all interconnected, and you try to observe the quantum interference with these atoms, and this result was published two years ago. And the title is Quantum Interference of Large Organic Molecules. So this means that if you are able to fully control these systems, you can still observe this quantum interference. So now we have again this question, where is the boundary between the macroscopic world and the microscopic world? And this is a key question. Let's say up to many years ago, the south answer was one, two particle. Now we know that we need more particle. And now we can come back to Schrodinger. I guess you already know the story, but I would like to tell you in a complete way. So the idea is the following. We take a box. Inside the box, we put a cat which is alive. We put also an atom. The atom can decay. During the, the decay, the atom can emit a photon. The photon is detected. When the photon is detected, a trigger is giving a signal to an armor, which is broken a glass, which contains some poison that will kill the cat. So now the point is the following. The atoms can be in a state, which is a superposition of being detected, decayed, and not decayed. This means that you can have a quantum state where you have atom excited, no photon emitted, plus atom not excited, photon emitted. When the photon is emitted, the cat is dead. So in our quantum formalism, we have the following picture. We can write the wave function where we have a tatum which is not decayed, a cat which is alive, and this is a superposition state with an atom decayed and the cat which is dead. So now imagine that you try to observe your atom. If you see that the atom is decayed, you can deduce that the cat is dead and vice versa. But now you can also make another type of measurement where, where you are able to measure an atom which is at the same time decayed and not. And if you measure an atom which is decayed and not, you would expect to see a cat which is live and dead. So now, what's the problem? Why I don't see a, a, a cat which is live and dead? And this story is more complex than it is usually said. If you want to measure a, a cat which is dead and live, you have to do a proper measurement on your cat to observe something like that. And not only, you have to imagine that all the environment, all the molecule, all the gas, which has around the cat, are somewhat measuring the cat. Because if the cat is dead, it's not emitting the same type of radiation from the body that if the cat is alive. This means that somewhat all the atmosphere is measuring the cat 
in, and it, it's changing the state of the cat as we see it. So this means that in principle, in the very, very, very principle, one could measure a cat which is dead and alive if you have under your control all your apparatus. Practically, it's impossible to see a cat which is dead and alive, and obviously no one is doing an experiment with a cat on a box and killing the cat. That's only a paradigm. What we can do is that we can try to have a cat made of light, and we can try to do this type of experiment in a lab, not using live animals, using atom and photon, and we can try to see the equivalent for a light beam of something which is at the same time dead and alive. And what is the interest of this research? In that you have, let's say, a boundary between the quantum and the classical world, and our goal is to try to change the boundary between these two worlds. And you can see that this is, on the right side, you have our world where all the reality is very well defined while on the other side, you have the quantum world where a cat can be dead and alive. Here, the smoke can have two different paths at the same time, and so on. So, since this Schrödinger paper on the cat of 1935, many persons have been trying to see some quantum phenomena, which can be the equivalent of the dead and alive cat, and there were some very interesting experiments done in Paris by Serge Arroche, Nobel Prize last year in 2012, where they could see a cat, let's say, made of 100 photons, where you had something like 100 photons, we can say, alive, and 100 photons which were dead. And what uh, this uh, work has shown is that when you increase the size of your quantum system, somewhat you are going from a quantum behavior where you can be two realities at the same time toward a classical behavior, which is the behavior of our everyday life. So now you have many fundamental questions about this, you can have philosophical question. You can say, ask yourself, is there a moon in the sky if I do not look at it? Or, or we can ask in a more philosophical way, are there objective properties that describe the reality before I observe it? And this is very interesting fundamental question. Now let me skip from this. And then one can ask ourselves, what is the wave function? This wave function, it's only a mathematical formalism that we exploit to describe the reality. So it's only a discussion on knowledge. Or the wave function is somewhat the reality. So it's really the essence of our world. So this is what we call really the investigation on the foundation of quantum mechanics and physics. But I don't want to focus on this. Let me jump on another side. I want now to go in a different direction. Sorry for skipping this slide. I want not to, to go, as I told you, we have a very strong interconnection between fundamental physics and technology. So many of our today technology are a consequence of quantum mechanics. You cannot have a laser. A laser is a direct consequence of quantum mechanics and many, many other technology. But we can say that all this technology are not really completely, fully exploiting what are the quantum behavior of particles. 
So in the 80s, 90s, many th physical theoreticians in the USA had the idea of combining together the information theory and quantum mechanics. The basic idea was to try to exploit the law of quantum mechanics to communicate, to manipulate, and to process the information. And what, are, what can be the application of this research field? You can have fundamental physics, but also you can have applied physics. You, can have, you may have application in quantum cryptography, in quantum computation, and so on. And what is the basic idea? And now we come back to the beginning of today's talks. Is the following. Rolf Landauer was a great physicist at IBM, and in the 60s, he introduced the expression, the information is physical. What does this mean? That if you want to manipulate the information, you have clearly to exploit the law of physics. So what we are using today is that we encode the information in bit. A bit can be either zero or one and we manipulate the bit according to the Boolean logic, which follows the classical physics. We are here a picture of matrix where all the reality is made only by bit, zero and one. And we know that we had this huge development of the information technology, where as I told you at the beginning, the power of computer is increasing very, very fast. So now what is the idea? is to try to replace the concept of bit with the concept of qubit, which means quantum bit. Why? Because what we have seen before in the quantum world, you, don't, you can be A and B, but you can also be A and B at the same time. So basically a qubit can be in the following state, alpha zero plus beta one, where the state zero and one represent your quantum states. You have a superposition between the two states and the number here shown, alpha and beta, are complex numbers. So what is, let's say, the idea? Imagine that you could have a device which manipulates quantum bit. With a standard computer, you are only able to do one operation per time. You want to make a multiplication, you need three times five, it's 15. But what we have seen, that the photon can go at the same time be on A and B. So you can imagine that you could have a computer which is not doing only one operation per time, but at the same time, it's doing all the possible operation because every qubit is not zero or one, but it is zero and one at the same time. And we call this the quantum parallelism because you can do all the operations at the same time. But now you have two problems. First problem, you need to have a quantum computer. So you need to have something which behaves in the quantum way where you can have logical operation where you manipulate this qubit. Second problem, what happens when I try to measure my qubit? When you will try to measure this state, you will only get or zero or one. So this means that in the quantum world, you are doing all the operation at the same time, but then when you try to measure your system to take the information, you only get a teeny part of information. How can we solve this second problem developing so-called quantum algorithms, which are able to do all these tasks in an efficient way. So the second problem is solved. We are back to the first problem. How can we have a device which behaves in a quantum way where you can have all these operation on the qubit? And the problem is that you want to have many, many qubits at the same time. Obviously, you have to have very advanced research facilities. So these qubits have been done in the lab. Many, many groups are working all around the world in this direction, 
it is not trivial at all. And I can tell you that today, uh, record of number of qubit is, let's say, around 10 qubit. So you can have a quantum system where you have 10 qubit that you are able to manipulate. So one can say 10, qub 10 qubit is a very low number because this computer has billion and billion in, of bit. But what I can tell you is that if you have something like 100 qubit, you are more powerful than a classical computer. So if you are able to go from 10 qubit to 100 qubit in a controlled way, you could have a computational power which is higher than your today computer. But going from 10 qubit to 100 qubit, it's a very huge technological challenge. So what I want to tell you now is this is a bit the idea. So we have Turing, which is the father of the classical computer. Feynman was the first to have the intuition that one could exploit quantum mechanics to elaborate information. And you have this, then this guy, Peter Shor, from uh, USA, which in 1994 developed theoretically one of these quantum algorithms, which are a key part of the story. So now I want to tell you very briefly what I'm, we are doing in Rome to do a quantum information. How do we do a qubit? We use a single photon. So you take a single photon and you write the information in the polarization of light. Do you know what is the polarization of light? You know? Someone else know what is the polarization of light? No, okay. One second. Let me see if I have my sunglasses. Yes, okay. So you know that the electromagnetic field is a wave. So we call polarization of light the direction where it's oscillating the electric field. So you have waves which propagate and the direction where you have the electric field, you call this polarization. And the polarization of light can be vertical, can be horizontal. Basically, it's a vector. So it can be plus 45 degree, minus 45 degree. It can be also circular polarization, where your electric field is rotating in time. Uh, do you know uh, polarized glasses during the summer? Do you know how does it this work? So the basic idea is that these light glasses, you buy it because when you go to the, the sea, the light which is reflected by the sea is mainly light which has horizontal polarization. So what you do with you, these glasses are able to absorb all the light which is horizontal and to transmit the light which is vertical. So if you put these glasses, you will only see the light which is vertical. And so basically it is helpful to reduce the background light. So if I'm able, no, I, I want to try to show you why all the light which is around us is light which is not polarized. So if you take these glasses and look, you will only see something which is less attenuated. But the light from arising from a computer and from the former generation of smartphone is a polarized light which is plus 45 degree. So if you take your sunglasses and rotate the sunglasses, at a certain point, the screen will disappear because the light will be out. So I don't know if you can see something. The first we see something could tend to the other one. Do you see something? Do you see that the skin is disappearing? Obviously only in front of the glasses. 
Uh, you, it is disappearing now. No, now, yes. Why? Because it is 45 degrees. So basically, what you are doing, this is a vector, so polarization of your screen. The glasses is another, it's making the, pro, you know, the pro, scalar product between vectors. When they are parallel, the two vectors, the scalar product is one. You see light. When your polarizer is orthogonal, you make the scalar product is zero. And that's why you don't see nothing. So basically what you are doing, you are measuring the polarization of light. And do you know how works the 3D cinema? You know the glasses are to put. Do, I, you know how this, you, you always say. So I will try to tell you very briefly how work a 3D cinema. So what is the principle? When you go to the, why do you have, why do you see the third dimension? every day, for two reasons. Because your eyes is putting in focus the image, and this gives you an idea of how far you are from me. And then you have two eyes. So basically, you have two different ways of seeing the object. The brain elaborates the information and gives you the idea of how far you are. So imagine I look something which is very, very far. The two eyes will basically see the same, inform the same image. My brain understands. If you see the same image, it's far. If you put your hand very close to here, you will see two different images because you have two different angles. The brain elaborates the information and tells you the image is very close. This is fine. So now imagine you want to cheat your brain. You go to the cinema and you want to have an idea of third dimension. So you want to send a different image to the right eye and the left eye. How can you do that? In the 80s, the 3D cinema was done with two glasses, one which was blue and one which was red colored. Have you ever seen these glasses? What is the idea? On your uh, screen, you send two images, one blue and one red. The blue image is going to the left eye. The red image is going to the right eye. OK? When you want to give an idea of something which is very far, the two images, blue and red, are superposed. Your brain sees the two images as superposed, and then you say it's far. When you want to give the information to your brain that something is going over you, the two images are split. So the two eyes, the two different images, your brain understands is very close. Do you get the point? OK. Now, what is the problem? That it's, it's bad because you are still seeing something on one eye which is blue and on the other eye which is red. So there is something going strange in your brain. So what is the idea? Imagine that you send on your screen light which is polarized. You send light which is horizontally polarized and vertical. And then your glasses will be something like that, where on, on one eye it's horizontal, on the other eye it's vertical. So you will send on the screen light which is horizontal and vertical. The light which is horizontally polarized will come to this eye, and the light which is vertical polarized will come to this light. And when you're going to give a different idea, you split the image. Is it clear? So if you, you can check that if you take off your glasses, you will see that so what is very far from you, you have only one image. What is very close, there are two images when you put off the glass. What is the problem? That if you turn your head, you will start mixing the two images because you are changing your reference frame. So it does not work. So how you do, you, you will not use horizontal and vertical polarized light. You will use circular right and circular left. This means that polarization can be horizontal and vertical, but can also be a rotating one. And she can rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. So on your, and what is the interesting of something which is circular? 
if you take something circular and you rotate, it is always circular. So your left eyes, we see a light which is clockwise, circular polarized, and the other eyes, we see a light which is left circular polarized. Is it fine? I have five minutes left. So now let me come back to the polarization and to the quantum information. I told you that light is like a vector. You know that if a vector is horizontal, you can have a vector which is vertical, and you can have a vector which is the sum of these two vectors. It is 45 degrees. You agree? We are back to the idea of a qubit. A qubit is something which is horizontal, vertical, but it can be also the sum of these two, horizontal and vertical. Indeed, the quantum world is described by vectorial mathematics. In the quantum world, you can have a state A, you can have a state B, and then you can have a sum of the two. So you have a very strong connection between this world and all the oper operation on the vectorial space. So how do we encode information? We use the polarization of light. And you can do amazing experiments where you send light, single photon from one island to another island. You can do quantum teleportation, but I, I will not go in details. What I want to show you is that what we are doing in our lab is that to do this experiment, you need a huge lab, huge. Nothing compared to what Catalina has shown you. It's one big room. So what we are working now is to try to move all this technology on a chip. So what you want to do is to generate single photon on a chip. You want to manipulate single photon on a chip. And you want to detect single photon on a chip. And that will be your quantum processor. So I must say, I'm, we already have this, but not to make selling of anything. This is still research. We are still far from having a quantum technology that we can deliver to the market tomorrow. So we have a European project on that. We have a partner like Toshiba that you know from computer. Also EBM is doing research on that and so on. What we did recently was a micro laboratory quantistic of photoni. And what we do is that we, we use the same principles that you use when you want to guide light inside a fiber. You know fiber optics, which send information to your home. So you have a material, and the light is guided inside the material. We do the same on a chip. So you have a chip. Inside this chip, you, can, you are able to engineer some waveguides where light will propagate. So you will send light, light will travel along this road and will be elaborated during the propagation. This is how we fabricate this chip. So do you know when you go to the Colosseum and you buy this piece of glass where the Colosseum is inside the glass? You also have with Tour Eiffel and in any touristic place. These gifts are made by taking a glass and focusing a laser inside the glass. And with the laser, you are able to burn the material inside. We use the same technology to fabricate with a laser beam, a waveguide inside the glass, but we do this with a control which is much, much higher than the one you need to have your small Colosseum or even your face inside the glass. So with this device, we have done, let's say, it's a transistor for light, which is able to work in the quantum regime. This is, how, so this is a schematic representation of how it can work. Then you can have more complex target, like doing quantum simulation. So now I want to tell you all what I said to you, I will show you summarized in three minutes by some guys from the UK. So now this will be, let's say, a summary of my talk made in three minutes. In the 20th century, electronics such as computers and music players 
changed everything. The 21st century promises a new revolution. Photonics. This is the Qubit Lab. Computers based on particles of light instead of electronic signals could be millions of times more powerful than today's best number crunchers, taking the most difficult computations and making them easier. Things like predicting the weather, the structure of drugs and medicine, even cracking encryption codes. So how do you make a computer with light? In modern electronics, complex processors are written on the tiny microchips. These are called integrated circuits. Researchers from Italy and Bristol and Oxford in the UK are developing tiny on-chip processors for light. This is the dawn of integrated optics. Light is made from quantum particles called photons. Photons carry information, and when photons interact, this information is processed, allowing computations. But photons also behave like waves, spreading out like ripples on a pond. It's easy to lose them. So the secret to integrated optics is waveguides. We've all seen these, simple optical fibers. These are a type of waveguide. Because light enters through one end, it's trapped and travels along the fiber without escaping. The internet is based on fibers like this. But you can't create a computer with just wires. You need processors where information is crunched. This chip has tiny waveguides written into it, which cross over so that photons interact in controllable ways. The waveguides are written by blasting a glass chip with ultra-short, intense laser pulses. By adjusting the depth of focus of the laser while the chips are moved around, guides can be written in 3D, winding around each other to produce any degree of interaction. Already, integrated circuits have been used to demonstrate quantum properties of photons as they hop between different waveguides on a chip. And circuits like these can be used to create tiny optical sensors capable of detecting small concentrations of chemicals in contact with the chip. And that's not all. Researchers are hoping to include tiny light sources and tiny photon detectors on the same chip. This would mean that photons would be manufactured, processed, and measured all in the same minuscule device. Laptops powered by light may be some years away still, but integrated photonics could form the basis for a range of new technologies benefiting from the quantum properties of light. I'm Gabe. And I'm Laura. And this has been Enlightening. Oh, see you next time. Enlightening. So I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, so before completing, I would like to, uh, this was the technological part. I would like also to show you a different way of telling the Schrodinger cat idea. You know, I will say uh, how this can be said in a more not correct way, but maybe more popular. Mm. Something is not working. Well, let's see. We might consider Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger? Is that the woman in 2A? No, that's Mrs. Grossinger. And she doesn't have a cat. She has a Mexican hairless, annoying little animal. Yep, yep, Sheldon! <laughs> Sorry, you diverted me. Anyway, in 1935, Erwin Schrodinger, in an attempt to explain the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, he proposed an experiment where a cat is placed in a box with a sealed vial of poison that will break open at a random time. Now, since no one knows when or if the poison has been released, until the box is opened, the cat can be thought of as both alive and dead. I'm sorry, I don't get the point. Well, of course you don't get it. I haven't made it yet. You have to be psychic to get it, and there's no such thing as psychic. Sheldon, what's the point? 
just like Schrodinger's cat, your potential relationship with Leonard right now can be thought of as both good and bad. It is only by opening the box that you'll find out which it is. Okay, so you're saying I should go out with Leonard? No, 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 no. <laughs> Let me start again. In 1935, <laughs> Schrodinger. So we said here's a quite simplified picture of the Schrodinger cat. If you want to see a Schrodinger cat, you need to have a full control on your system. It's, there is no mystery. It's a wave function which describes the systems. You, want, you have to control the atmosphere. You have to control everything. You have to find the proper way to see the cat, which is dead and alive. And our goal is to try, as let's say, researcher, to try to move this boundary between classical and quantum world. And we, our game is to be able to get this quantum technology maybe out of our lab, maybe 10 or 15 years. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>